Hello, everyone. We are coming live from the PMI Global Congress 2014 here in Phoenix. And with me this morning are Christy Tan Nekowitz and also Dev Ramcharan. Hello, Christy. Hello. She's currently wearing my other uh, headset and Dev is sitting next to us sort of uh, on the side and we will bring him into the conversation a little later on. Both Dev and Christy are going to be presenting, is it today? Yes. Yeah, later, later today. today. And the title of your presentation is Skills to Shine. Tap your interpersonal skills to advance as a project manager. Before we get into this, let me ask you a general question. How did you decide that you wanted to present here at the PMI Global Congress? How did that happen? So actually, Dev and I were invited to speak along with our colleague, Mark Docterman, who we've been doing a panel together for PMI on sort of a webinar platform where we would give our opinions and the audience would give us, you know, throw questions at us and we take turns answering the questions. We've done this a couple of times now for PMI to attract members of PMI who have gotten their PMP and now wondering what they should do next with their career. So it's a little bit about like career development, what do I do next type of webinar. And they thought it was very successful and they invited us to speak. Perfect. Now, your topic, skills to shine, tap your interpersonal skills to advance as a project manager. What we're going to do, we're going to follow along the presentation, not go into it in complete detail. You start out the presentation with a perfect question, why should you care about interpersonal skills? So why should our listeners care about our conversation this morning? Well, it's something that we believe very strongly about, and I think it's because we've lived through the pains of not caring. So in the beginning of my career, because I have an engineering background, I always thought, you know, it's about getting things done. And if it wasn't for all the people, we would get things done so much faster. You know, all these people, problems that we have. When I became a manager, you know, my biggest complaint was all the people problems that we had. Why can't we just all get things done and stop worrying about the people problems? And it was not until um, about five years later into a management role that I realized, my goodness, that is my job. It, the people problems, that's really my job, you know, the, and if I take care of that, everything else will take care of itself. So I devoted a lot of my management career in developing people taking care of the interpersonal issues, interpersonal problems, communication problems. Excellent. So let's jump into the skills. The first thing you talk about are behavior styles. Why do they matter? Why are they important? So I actually think about a person that you're interacting with as a, sort of a combination of eight different aspects of their person. And one of them is how they behave. So that's one aspect of a person. And I also go on to you know, the other aspects as well in this presentation. So I don't like the type of personality typing or the type of, you know, behavior style identifications that people do to brand you as, oh, he's an extrovert or, you know, she's an introvert or, you know, he's a type A or a driver or such and such. I like to think of it as only one aspect of a person. So I always start when I teach and talk about, you know, developing people and understanding who you're talking to and who you're working with. I like people to think about behavior as one aspect. And I help people identify the, you know, four different uh, common behaviors that we see in everyone. And everyone behaves in varying degrees of, you know, in this case, what I'm talking about is the DISC model, which is, you know, DISC stands for dominance, influence, compliance standards, and steady. Okay. And these are the four behavior styles. Yes, the primary behavior styles, and we all have a blend of them. Okay. So I like this model, DISC model that we use, because it doesn't say you're this letter, but it actually says you are this blend. So. Okay, get it. All right. Uh, we're moving on from the behavior models onto the motivators. What are motivators? How do they fit into the skills that uh, we need to advance as project managers? So motivators are probably the most important things to understand when you're dealing with people because it's why they do what they do and what makes them passionate. So, you know, you may know someone to be a certain behavior style, but when you trample on something that's important to them, that something that motivates them, they become a different person. So 
it's not enough to understand how somebody behaves all the time, but it, it's important to understand what motivates them and why they choose to behave that way. So I talk about the six different common motivator categories that we all have. And our top two are the ones that drive us to, into action. So usually if you're, you, know, you ask me to you know, watch a certain genre of movie or you know, d- do, perform a certain task for you, and if, it's, if I feel okay about that, that fits within my motivators, I'll do it. But if it's something I'm really passionate about, I'm going to do it really well. So when you're dealing with people or you're managing people or you're thinking about your career, you want to tap into what motivates you so you can be the best that you can be. Does it also help me to understand other people's motivators, the people on my team, Absolutely. to use it to the benefit, to help them? Absolutely. So depending on the perspective. So the first thing I teach everybody is that you have to understand yourself, and then you can begin to understand other people. So, so there are aspects of you know, identifying your own preferences, your own motivators, and then help you to identify that in other people so that when you are trying to work with them, you speak their language. You speak a language that motivates them. So I'd like to give an example of like, if you're trying to sell somebody a house, and the house has many, you know, a project in this case, you want somebody to work on your project, like a house. And the house has many different rooms, and there are different corners of the house, and there, you know, there's exterior, interior. And if you're selling the house to somebody who is a chef, you want to, show, you want to talk about the kitchen. If you're selling somebody who loves to plant flowers in a garden outside, you talk about the yard. You know, so you're still talking about the same project and you're still selling them the same project, but you're tapping into what motivates them and what makes them want to do the best. All right. We're moving on to emotional intelligence as another skill that we need. What is it? Why does it matter? So emotional intelligence is one of those things where you notice it when someone doesn't have it. <laughs> <laughs> and it's really important because it actually makes 90% of the difference between a star performer in a leadership role and an average performer. So that is the key difference between somebody who's an average leader from someone who's a star leader. And, you know, so they can have similar educational backgrounds, qualifications, and experience. You know, that makes a difference. So, you know, in my business, we say that an executive is often hired for his resume and fired for his lack of emotional intelligence. <laughs> so to me, that's just so important. And emotional intelligence helps us get ahead, no matter whether we're in, in a you know, team member role or a team lead role. How do I obtain emotional intelligence? You should take my class. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> you walked right into that one. I couldn't resist. Sorry. And we will put a link to your class into the show notes. Okay. Sounds good. There are actually five competencies that build on each other in emotional intelligence. So it starts with self-awareness. You know, just like I said earlier, you have to understand yourself before you can help, uh, you know, help yourself and help other people. So it's the five competencies you know, built on top of each other, starting with self-awareness and to self-regulation, regulating your own responses to stimulus, you know, to stress, and then tapping into your motivation, showing empathy. You know, a lot of people think um, emotional intelligence is just empathy, but that's like the fourth component of it. And if you don't have the last three, you can't even do that genuinely. And then social skills. All that together creates emotional intelligence. Your class isn't going to be enough. I know. <laughs> I mean, your class will give us the basics. Right. It will introduce mm-hmm. us to what it's yes. all about. But then you actually have to go out there. Exactly. You have to apply it. You have to fail. You, you have, have to, to learn, learn from your failures. Yes. And you have to grow and you have to be exactly. willing to, 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 to take the feedback you get. That's right. right. Yeah. So it's, you know, it's the you know, practice. Like you said, you have to fail. You have to learn from your mistakes. And that's why emotional intelligence is one of those rare things that you can grow all your life. It's not like your IQ where, you know, you, you, your IQ is stuck typically by the time you're age five. You know, you, that's your IQ and that's the IQ you'll have for the rest of your life for the most part. But EQ for, that measures emotional intelligence actually grows as you gain more experiences and you learn from them and you adjust, you know. So it, it's actually one of those things that's fascinating. And, you know, so to grow from a team member to a team leader and knowing this is, the one thing that makes a key difference 
and the ability that everybody can learn this. It's not like, oh, my IQ is not high enough for that, you know? <laughs> <laughs> you know? So it, it's one of those things that I, I find very rewarding in teaching people because they can, their capacity to grow is actually incredible. Okay, before my last question mm -hmm. for you, uh, let's just recap. Okay. the uh, skills that we need to advance as project managers in, in your part of the presentation at least. Uh, so we start out with the behavior skills, then we talked about the motivators, and now we've closed with emotional intelligence and the five competencies, self-awareness, self-regulation, motivation, empathy, and social skills. Yes. The final slide that you have under the mm. uh, emotional intelligence is the emotional wake. And I love that. <laughs> Explain to us the emotional wake, what it is, and how we can make this into a positive experience for the people who are in our emotional wake. Okay, so I was told that when people see the term wake, they think about two different things. So. I'm not talking about the kind of wake where you visit somebody who has passed away. And, you okay. Know. Okay, that's We're not... We're talking <laughs> about the, the, the waves yes. behind a boat, the that's wake right. behind a boat. So I'm right. talking about the wake when you have a speedboat and yes. you're speeding around the lake and people behind your boat are being rocked, you know, into what a disturbance or it could be a very peaceful, gentle wake, you know. So your emotional wake is how you leave people feeling after they have an interaction with you. And... One way to test your emotional wake is when you're walking towards somebody, do they suddenly remember that they forgot something in their office and turn around and go back to their <laughs> office? <laughs> or do they come up to you and can't wait to talk to you and say, hey, I want to tell you what happened in this project or at this meeting or I want to tell you what happened over my weekend. So that's a good test of your emotional wake. All right. Wonderful. That was part one of our presentation, Tap Your Interpersonal Skills to Advance as a Project Manager. And now we are going to switch the headphones over to Dev. Thank you very much, Christy. Thank you. All right, the headphones are switched over. Hello, Dev. Welcome back to the Project Management Podcast. It's wonderful to be here. And it's wonderful to finally meet in person. <laughs> All right, but back to the presentation at hand. Tap your interpersonal skills to advance as a project manager. Your part of the presentation begins with culture awareness. What is it? Why does it matter? Many of us as project managers, uh, especially at the earlier stages of our career, go into an organization thinking in terms of the way it ought to work. I have a particular role to play as a project manager. The organization ought to then play nicely with me and with my role. And what we forget is we go into organizations as change agents, which means we're stirring things up. We're shaking cages. We're trying to drive things through an organization that may be stressed, it may be overtasked, and it may have a legacy of a way of doing things and interacting within itself and with people outside. Culture is about how things work in people interactions, complementary to the systems, processes, and organizational structures that exist. If we don't understand the culture and how those things work, Chances are we're going to be highly ineffective and frustrated as project managers. Okay, so the first thing we have to have is awareness of the culture, right? And then you move on actually to talking about organizational culture. So we have the awareness that it exists. So uh, how does the organizational culture help me? How does it become a skill for me? to advance as a project manager. Okay, we could probably look at it from the pessimistic negative side first and then move into the sort of the, the constructive and positive side because I think that's the right, the right approach to talk through that. That's the most important part, which you just asked. If we do not understand the culture of an organization, if we don't take the time to learn it, to become cognizant of how things work and how people work with each other, how work flows through an organization affected by human personality and relationships, uh, as well as the legacy and the history of how the organization has developed, then what we will find is we will not be able to drive work through the departments, the organizations, leveraging the workflows and processes only. If, however, we do take the time to do that, then what we can find is we now have an additional thing together with the standard business processes, which is a network of well-calibrated uh, and deeply understood and valued relationships with the people such that 
we have now come into and connected ourselves to the culture, its background, the particular rhythms that it works to, and are more effective in getting work through the organization. Next, you have a discussion about organizational politics. Very close to organizational culture, they go hand in hand. I assume the argument here is very much the same. Yes. We need to understand it. We need to use it. It becomes a skill if we learn about it, if we know it. Is that about right? Absolutely. When you think about a country, for instance, the United States, the United States has a rich and extremely diverse culture, but it has an identifiable culture. It's the way things currently are, based on the way things have been, based on the composition of the population, its historical experience, etc. Politics is about the use of power, as well as social networking in that culture to achieve results. So, you might think politics is always a bad thing. But if you don't understand who the key decision makers are, who the people are that can get things done, That guy with the masking tape on the nose bridge of his glasses, who is the only person that understands the COBOL underpinnings of that legacy system that was made when your grandpappy was a developer, that man is going to be one of the key levers of power in the organization to get things done. So politics is a learned sensitivity to who is able to get what done to support your project in getting it actually completed Uh, in the time frame, in the budget, and with the outcomes and quality that you're looking to be able to achieve. And as you're doing this, conflict is inevitable, which is also, by a pure coincidence, the next part of the presentation, the next skill that we as project managers need. Tell us about conflict management and its importance. Probably one in a hundred project managers ever experiences conflict in any stage of a project, statistically (laughs) speaking, (laughs) if you're a crazy person. You know, we all experience conflict. They say there's only one type of project where you will not have any conflict, and that's the one person project. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Unless you're a conflicted individual. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so in managing conflict, since it's inevitable, it's always good to have in mind different approaches that we can take. We can take an approach which is all about compromise. And what happens in that particular instance is you have a halfway sort of resolution. It's sort of a, it's sort of a, 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 a truce-based uh, sort of resolution. It really doesn't resolve the problem. It may not resolve the root causes. It may just get a piece in place to make some kind of progress. The best kind of conflict resolution is where we collaborate together. We share what we feel from both sides, and we work out what is the best outcome for us both. Another sort of less than ideal uh, outcome in, in conflict uh, management might be avoidance. And that's, that's a style that some people have. You know, you hide away from the problem as much as you can, hoping and praying that it will evaporate on its own. That's one approach, but we know what the result of that is. The other one is my way, my way or the highway. That's a very North American masculine kind of approach, by the way, where there's a winner and there's a loser. And that invariably leads to someone losing because someone didn't get their way. And then there's the accommodation. Okay, let's just do it your way to keep the peace. Uh, And can I tell you, Cornelius, that's a very European approach, actually. Very Uh, Swiss. Yes, very, uh, you just, 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 everybody, let's stay calm. Okay, do what you need to do, and let's move forward. The best way to resolve it is a collaborative sort of approach and model to conflict resolution. Right, and you actually have that model in the presentation here. Now, uh, earlier on, I asked Christy, well, uh, how can I learn about emotional intelligence? And uh, she uh, guided us to her class. Let's see, how can I learn about conflict management as a project manager? Do you have a class? (laughs) (laughs) I'm sure Christy does, actually. And I know she's a fabulous teacher because I've heard her in action. Um, This really takes us into the last point of discussion, which is about finding the kind of people who you note are good at these things that Christy and I have been talking about. Someone who may be very proficient in emotional intelligence, and don't be too proud, it may be somebody junior to you or that reports to you. Right? Finding someone who is able to work with organizational politics, someone who is able to do good conflict resolution, 
and using that individual as a person that can observe you in action and then coach you in rounding out and sharpening those skills. The coach may be somebody who's formerly a coach. It's actually their job. Or the coach may be somebody that you look up to and use as a mentor, as a, as a coach in the workplace or someone in the industry that you reach out to. I've been recommending Christy all over the place in some of the work we've been doing this morning as somebody who's uh, an ideal... Yeah, but but it's here. true. It's true. As an ideal mentor who has made her way through to an executive level, having gone through all the glass ceilings to get there with ample experience in order to support and coach young women practitioners making their way through all of the mazes and hurdles of a career in project management. That's the kind of mentor you want to find. So that's what I mean by mentoring and coaching. These people can help you in the skills you need to sharpen and have a fabulous career in project management. Right. And just to recap uh, from your part of the presentation, we started out with the fact you need cultural awareness, which leads you to understand your organizational culture. You also have to know your organizational politics. You must be able to have a good conflict management skills, and you've given us the model. And your recommendation is for everybody to use a coach to help them better themselves. So uh, in conclusion, a project manager who has all these skills, who tries to better himself or herself with these skills, what kind of career can they look forward to? A fabulous career. And I'll go right back to the first slide that, uh, that uh, Christy talked to us about. And that is the slide that had to do with why should I care about this stuff? <laughs> we are people managing change through people that impacts people either for good or for evil. So consequently, understanding people interactions is vitally important to what we do. We could take the thought and the and the position. Well, I'm a project manager. I don't give uh, you know. Uh, I don't I don't care about that stuff because that's all that emotional nonsense. All I care about is getting the job done. And then the wake in your way. Yes, it's the effects behind you, but it could also be something like Finnegan's Wake, where you've got dead people behind you and lots of words, <laughs> right? <laughs> so so the advice I know Christy and I would give is this is important. And it differentiates the very best. Remember what, what Christy said. Your IQ gets you the job. Your EQ gets you promoted or terminated. And that's the bottom line for us as PMs in this new world. Wonderful. Dev, and once again, Christy, thank you so much for your time this morning. I appreciate it. Our pleasure.